there was a, a man many years ago named William Penn, P-E-N-N. And he was a Puritan. He was one of those Christians in the history of Christianity that not only fought against the prominent expression of Christianity at the time, but even the newer expression of Protestantism. The Puritans just believed in, in being just as pure as, as possible. Uh, the Quakers, uh, you've probably heard these words before in church history, or maybe in American history, because they came from Europe over here for religious freedom. Unfortunately, there are some things in Christianity that are not so loving. A lot of them felt empowered to come and enslave the Africans and take the land from the indigenous. Yet they called themselves Christians. William Penn had the mentality that he would go over to the New World. And he would set up a colony a little different. You see, the king had given them the authority to come over here and take what they wanted. But his mindset was the land belonged to the indigenous. History says Indians, but in reality, they only called Indians because the person who came here thought he was an Indian. So I'm not gonna disrespect them by calling them that, the indigenous Americans who are already here. William Penn felt that the land belonged to them. So he had no right to take it, but he was willing to purchase it. He had a whole different type of mentality. He believed in brotherly love. He wanted to be at peace. There's a state called Pennsylvania because of William Penn. And the capital city is Philadelphia. That state is in our nation today because a man named William Penn wanted to show love to his brother. But where is the love? I don't live in Pennsylvania. I do know to all cowboy fans, you might remember, Michael Irvin one day was in Philly and he tried to avoid a hit and his head hit the ground and it did something kind of bad to his neck and it was the last time he ever played professional football and they cheered. Not a lot of brotherly love going on there. Well, William Penn wasn't the first person to have an idea that didn't necessarily go right over time. There's a text in John chapter 10 where Jesus is talking to the Pharisees explaining to them, this is verse 1, I tell you the truth, the man who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way, is a thief and a robber. The man who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The watchman opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes ahead of them. And his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Now John, he gives commentary here in verse number six and notes, uh, Jesus used this figure of speech, but they did not understand what he was telling them. Therefore, Jesus said again, I tell you the truth, I'm the gate for the sheep. All who ever came before me were thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and to kill and destroy. I have come, this is where we're going to drop anchor, I have come that they might have and have it to the full. Some versions will say and have it more 
abundantly. William Penn had a dream that he could set up a place where people can be respected. Dr. King had a dream that the world could be a place where folk won't be judged by the color of skin but content of character. But Jesus also had a dream, if you will. He had a dream, he had a plan to come and give you and I the ability to live the abundant life. But just as it is from time to time, Plans that are put in place by great people and even God do not always come to fruition because sometimes life just gets in the way. History says that even though William Penn had this idea, ultimately the indigenous people were treated harshly by the Europeans. Disease came and ravaged them because the populace of North America wasn't used to the things going on in Europe. They were killed with weapons. And ultimately, America is here today because the Europeans took it from the folk who were already here and felt vindicated to do so. Maybe Dr. King's dream is partially here, but we know that racism still exists, now does it? But it's the same thing in Jesus' situation. How many Christians today are living the abundant life, Brother Stevie? mentioned it even in communion, that there are certain freedoms we've been given. We have been called, we have been saved by grace through faith. And since that is the situation, we should live a certain way. We should live that out. I'm going to call it the abundant life. You and I have been given the ability, in, in, in light of our failure, in light of our yesterday, in light of our sin, to still live life to the full, to live the abundant life. And it's because or by way of being children of God, following Jesus Christ, that's how we get to the point where we live the abundant life. There are so many people today who profess to be Christians, yet they still struggle. They still deal with depression. They're making bad decision after bad decision, and they're not living the abundant life. And it's because, as Jesus noted, they're not coming in through his gate. They're not doing it his way. They're doing it their way. You see, Jesus says when you become a follower, he is a, a, a real sheep. You're not going to listen to the false shepherds. There are some false shepherds out there in the world messing with people's head, causing them to think a certain way and believe a certain way. Let me tell you, the scripture let us know there's a way that seems right to humanity. But the end thereof are the ways of death, the ways of destruction. And there are plenty of false shepherds out in the world using media, politics, and all kind of foolishness to convince Christians that they should be doing a certain thing. That's them not following the good shepherd, the real shepherd. And because of that, even though Jesus came that you and I might live the abundant life, there are so many Christians not living life to the full. And it's because they're not trusting God. They're not trusting the Son of God, the Spirit of God, and His Word. What would it be like if these dreams, these ideas that were put in place all those years ago from William Penn to Dr. King to Jesus Christ? What would it be like if this was really a, a place of brotherly love? What would it be like if we were judged, if you will, by how we act and how we live and not by how we look. What would it be like if I as a Christian, if the Christian church holistically live the abundant life, living it to the full? You and I in this country have the freedom. Oh my God, Jesus. We have the freedom to come into this place and give God praise, honor, and glory. Yet a lot of church doors, buildings that is, a lot of buildings the doors are not being opened because we have better things to do. We have the opportunity, the, the, the opportunity to grow the, kill, the kingdom, to build the kingdom, to express our faith to men and women all over this country. But what are we really doing? Are we expressing ourselves? What are our priorities? You know, we can't teach what we don't know. Y'all do recognize that, right? 
we, we can't teach what we don't. If our glass is empty, then we can't pour it in another person. We have to allow God to, to fill our glass with wisdom and knowledge, discernment, the ability to deal with the text, to promote the faith. And if we don't do those things, the Lord have mercy, how are we going to live life to the full? Uh, Christians are in a place where they have better things to do. Not that they really have better things to do. They just have been duped by the other shepherd to believe that that's what they should be doing. And rather than prioritize God in their lives, putting him at the top, they prioritize God out. And when they get around to having time for God, then and only then, well, they do it Wednesday during prayer connect. I was talking about the difference between accidents and, and, and purpose. So uh, uh, sometimes, God forbid, when we leave here today, God forbid, when we leave here today, we have an accident. We're driving down a, rel we're driving down a road and something happens that was not planned. That's why it's called an accident. And we have insurance just in case accidents take place. Well, this thing called Christianity can be accidental. It actually be, have to be on purpose. We have to purposefully put things in place so we can become what God called us to be if we're going to be living life to the full. How much different would the church be if Christians on an individual level got to the point where they come to God and, and, and raise their hands and say, God, I want to live life to the full. I want to be, God, all that you have called me to be. Everything that your son died for me to be, God. Remove any and everything out of my life, Father, that keeps me from being what you've called me to be. How much of a difference the church would be on this planet? Jesus gives witness in Matthew 5. You don't put a candle under a bushel. But you put it on a candlestick so it illuminates. So many Christians church are putting their candle under a bush. Hiding the gift that God has given them. Refusing to live the calling that God has called them to live. And subsequently not living the abundant life. Life to the full. Uh, Stephen noted earlier and I agree. It takes grace. We have to give people the opportunity to become All of us are a work in progress. None of us have arrived. But we're never going to arrive if we don't do what it is that God has called us to do. We have to recognize that Jesus is the good shepherd. And if we're going to be what God has called us to be, we have to follow his voice. That nobody else's. And that includes not even the voice of me. I cannot follow my own voice. I cannot pick my own path. I have to follow the voice of God. What would Jesus have me to do? When I started, when I started questioning, love your enemies. Really, Jesus? You, do I? Really? See, that's not my voice. Loving people that hate me is not my voice. Doing evil for evil is my voice. Vindicating myself is my voice. Loving people, that's his voice. Making sure that I take time to do what's important. Study. Uh, first thing I did this morning, first thing I do most days when I wake up, is study something. Whether it's a biblical document or an extra biblical document that talks about the Bible, I have to be in the study. It make me better than anybody. It just means that I'm trying to make sure I'm prepared to live life to the full. Many times people have come to me with some theological foolishness. And I've had to defend this thing that I call Christianity. And if I have not put myself in a situation to allow God to give me his counsel, then how can I defend it? How can I stand in front of his people and say, thus said the Lord, if I have no concept of what this says? How can I help someone understand what salvation looks like and not look like? You know, I'm trying to wrap this up, I'm trying to put my four. You know how many Christians 
are so, Lord Jesus, help me, Holy Spirit. There are so many Christians who think they are in a good place in their spirit and in their theology and even in their relationship with God. And the only reason they think that is because they actually don't know what this Bible teaches. The only reason. One day, long, long time ago, I was having a conversation with a, with a, with a, with a Christian man. He told me, he said, John 3.16 is the most important scripture in the Bible. You remember that one? For God so loved the world that gave the only God the Son, who believed in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. His premise is once you believe and once you got that good, you're straight. So you're trying to tell me I have all this information. And John 3.16 is the only thing I'm supposed to pay attention to. That's your logic. That's where we are with. God took the time to send men to put stylus to papyrus, to prepare us for the mission. And whether it's John 3, 16, or even Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, Romans 8, and 1, pick your verse that makes you think that you've done everything you need to do, and I can give you a thousand of them that'll tell you you might want to rethink that. Yes, I am saved by grace through faith, but being saved comes with a responsibility. Faith is something that we don't just talk about. It's something that we live out. And that's the part of Christianity that people are struggling with, living it out. Well, 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 Coleman, that sounds like works righteousness. No, you ain't never going to live that good now. Neither am I. Nobody's going to live that good. But here's the story. I get the perks of being a, a, a driver or a, a UPS employee, not just because I'm on the payroll, but because I actually put on a uniform, get on a truck, and move some stuff around. I have a responsibility to the company I work for. My premise is you and I as Christians have a responsibility to God. And we have in that responsibility, let Jesus lead us. Let his voice be the one that guides us. When he opens up the gate or when he allows us to know the path, it's his path that we're on. It's, it's his voice that we listen to. That's not an option. That's, that's, that's the job. Jesus says, my sheep know my voice. And if I am not listening to him, then I come and tell you I'm not his sheep. Period. And we fool ourselves if we think that we are. At least that's what Jesus says. I tell you the truth. I'm the gate of the sheep. All those who came before me are robbers. The sheep didn't listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through, through me, Jesus says, will be saved. He will come in and go out. He will find pasture. The thief comes in only to steal, to kill, to destroy. I have come that they might have life and have it to the full. If you happen to be tired of struggling in your faith, if you happen to be tired of struggling in your mind, in your heart, in your soul, and in your spirit, the solution is simple. Get that thing to Jesus. You get to the point where you say to yourself and to God, I have tried it my way. It did not work. I tried it again, and it still did not work. Sort of, I, I'm using it. It, it. It's like when the brother says, So I dig into my pocket and all my money is spent, so I dig deeper. And still coming up with Lent, y'all don't judge me, Rakim. But my premise is sometimes we'll try something and we'll try it and we try it again and it keeps on failing. So I'm saying, I'm begging the church today, get to that point in your faith that you understand. I'm not doing it my way anymore. I'm not listening to my voice. I'm not listening to my ways and my understanding. God, take the wheel. And I encourage you to allow God to be your little old Tesla. Let God put it on autopilot, get all the way out the back front seat, get in the back seat. Matter of fact, get in the trailer. Get in the trailer and just let God take you where God wants to take you. And I promise you, you'll live the You'll live life 
mind to the full. You'll have that peace that surpasses all understanding because you're letting the one who knows make the decisions in your life. Yeah. It, 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 it boggles me, church, how you and I, from time to time, can make decisions as if we know what tomorrow holds. Like, we, we really got this. Somebody said, you want God to laugh? Tell him your plans. Tell him your plans. Well, what you going to do? You can't add one cubit to your statue, Jesus says. In Matthew chapter 6, only God can do that. Sermon on the Mount. Uh, is six? Uh, where are you today? I, I, I asked you, I encourage you, when we started today, I asked you to go into that place where you and God meet. And in that place, consider what Christianity looked like to you. And that was kind of a precursor to this sermon. What does it look like? When, when, when you consider, when we consider Jesus being the shepherd and we have a responsibility to his shepherding, where are we? Is Christianity just this thought? Sometime in my past, I, I, I said the sinner's prayer. I, I, I call God, I call Jesus into my heart so I'm good. Is that it? Is that what Christianity is to you? Come on, I, because if, if that's your theology, I got some bad news for you. I, I don't know if that's going to work well for you. Because some point, you and I are going to have a discussion. You and I are going to look Yahweh in his eye and give an account for everything we did. And even if we say, well, God, I understood that I was saved by grace through faith, not of works. I can only imagine what he would say. So that means you don't do nothing? That was your logic. Your logic was, since I was so good to send my son to die, that your response is to sit there and do nothing. That's your logic. But I'm just a human. That might be too human. Maybe God's grace will say something different. Don't know. I tell you this. If I gave my daughter to die in a response to her giving her life people basically turned up their nose and played like they didn't care I would have a problem there and I promise you to my heart I'm willing to believe God is too I'm not even going to lie to you the time will come the judgment will begin with the house of the Lord and I ask you although it's not a very popular teaching. If everybody in Christ is going to be saved, then what is the point of judgment beginning with the house of the Lord? I need you to think about that. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful just for this opportunity to get in the Word, to study God, to, to consider this text in John 10 where Jesus tells us he has come that we might have the ability to live life to the full, to live the abundant life. Undoubtedly, Jesus was wise in his words. So many wolves out here, God, calling us to live different ways, calling us to, to have different paths that don't even look like faith, don't even look like salvation. They, they don't look like a commitment to the mission of Jesus, God. We get so wrapped up in our own mission, doing it our way, focusing on what we want, holy God, that we don't take the time to consider, are we really being what you have called us to be? Are we living that out? Yes, yes, we believe. We believe that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. Father, we have that down. But what about becoming? What about the response to the fact that we do believe it? Oh, Father, we struggle right there. Oh, Father, we struggle right there. There's still so much us in the way that we can't put the cross in front of us. There's so much of our will, our plan, that we can't put the cross in front of us, God. And because of that, the church, Holy Father, is just in a bad place. But we're hoping, God, we're praying.
praying, we're studying, we're, we're calling, we're meditating, we're touching, we're agreeing, we're doing everything we can to try to be that body of believers that encourages the saints to become, not just believe, but become. Live this thing out. Not that we're going to live it out perfectly. Nobody is. Which is why we're saved by grace through faith. But because, Father, we have been saved, why not live like we're saved? Why not worship and praise like we're saved? Pray like we're saved. Study like we're saved. Tithe like we're saved. Preach the word like we're saved. Why not? Why not live that out as saved people? Oh, Father, the struggle is real. And we call you on you today to help us not just believe, but also become.